Hello friends and welcome to another episode in the teaching series. Hey, if you tuned in to last week's teaching, you will recall that I tackled a passage in Luke chapter 7 where Jesus raises a boy back to life. And we talked about how the Jews had a profound sense of place and that geography holds the memory. So whenever we're studying a passage, if the geography is given, one of the things that we need to do in order to set this text in its ancient context is to simply ask a geographical question, which is, where are we on a map? And once we figure that out, a really great follow-up question to ask is, has anything happened here before? And so we did that with that Luke 7 passage, and we found that Jesus raised this boy back to life in Nain. And when we asked the question, has anything like this happened here before? We found that just on the other side of the hill of Moray, 800 years earlier, Elisha raised a boy back to life. And so we saw this amazing connection that on the either side of the hill of Moray, Jesus heals and brings a boy back to life and Elisha does the same thing. And it launched us on this journey of trying to figure out, well, if Jesus attached himself to Elisha and everything Jesus did was intentional, are there any other stories where Jesus connects himself to Elisha? And we saw four different connections to these stories of raising the dead on the hill of Moray, which launched us in the original study, um, a story about improving water, a story about feeding many with minimal food, and then a story of healing leprosy. And some of you will recall that in the last episode, I said, I want to come back to this one in the next episode. And I want to look at a connection between Elisha healing Naaman or God healing Naaman through the prophet Elisha and Jesus healing the 10 lepers. Now I mentioned that there are actually several stories of Jesus healing lepers, but this particular story in Luke 17 has a number of fascinating connections back to this Elisha and Naaman story. So Luke chapter 17, I just want to read this story and help us get the context of what's going on here before we engage the Elisha Naaman story in a little bit more detail. So here we go, verse 11, Luke 17. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And as he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, master, have pity on us. When Jesus saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. So that's our story in Luke 17. Now, let me pull in the story from 2 Kings chapter 5. And here's just a brief summary of that. You have a guy by the name of uh, Naaman, who is the commander of the army of Aram. So this is a Syrian army, and they were like the arch nemesis of Israel at this time. And on one of Naaman's raids into the land of Israel, he captures a young Israelite girl. He takes her back and she becomes a slave in his household to his wife. And this Israelite girl says to Naaman's wife, like, if only he could see the prophet Elisha, he could be healed of his leprosy. And so Naaman goes back into the land of Israel, into the area of Samaria. He has a conversation with Elisha. And Elisha says, I want you to go to the Jordan River in order to be cleansed. And here's the climactic moment, 2 Kings 5 verses 14 to 15. So he, Naaman, went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all of his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. 
So these are our two stories before us, and I want to help you to see five connections between Naaman and particularly this one person who comes back in this Luke 17 story when all 10 are cleansed, but one comes back, a connection between this one and Naaman and how these stories just mesh together. So here we go. Connection one, both events occurred in the same area. There is our geographical linkage. So on a map here, these stories take place southwest of the Sea of Galilee. And we have here that Elisha is met by this man Naaman at Dotan. And again, Elisha is going to send him to the Jordan River, but the initial encounter happens in Dotan. Now, in the Luke 17 story, we're not told where. According to tradition, it happened at this place called Gene. Luke just tells us it was a village, but he says it was on the border of Galilee and Samaria, which runs right through here. So we're in the ballpark, all right? Between Dotan and Gene is about five miles, and so these stories happen in the vicinity of one another. Connection one. Connection two, both men had leprosy. Now, we could spend a lot of time talking about the implications of this in the ancient world, and we'll look at a story at some point where Jesus heals a man with leprosy because what's going on in, in that particular story and the stories about Jesus healing people with leprosy is just mind-blowing of the connections and the implications therein. Um, I just will say that leprosy back then is not what we understand as Hansen's disease today. Any kind of skin rash or disorder could constitute as leprosy, and there were a lot of pieces connected to this. But just understand a second connection is, is that both men had leprosy. Connection three, both had to go somewhere for healing. Now, this is bizarre in the scriptures. Very rarely is someone sent somewhere else to be healed. Jesus does this on a couple of occasions, but this is a very rare thing to have happen. In the Elisha Naaman story, Elisha goes 25, or excuse me, he sends Naaman 25 miles to the Jordan River, and this is where Naaman experiences his cleansing of his leprosy. In the Luke 17 story, Jesus is sending them to the priests, and that by implication is in Jerusalem at the temple. This is a 50-mile trek to go up to Jerusalem, and you go into the temple. So here's a model of the temple. And on the temple mount to the temple proper, you go in, and this is known as the chamber of the lepers. And this is where the priests would indicate that someone was cleansed. And so they both have to go somewhere else for healing. Connection four is both were foreigners. Now, this is just astounding, the scandalous grace and mercy of God healing both Naaman and this person in Luke 17. Naaman, again, was the commander of the Syrian army, of the kingdom of Aram. It would be like God healing the commander of ISIS today. Okay, it's that scandalous. In fact, Jesus in his synagogue sermon in Luke 4, Jesus references this story and it almost gets him killed. Why? Because Jesus is talking about God's immense grace for all people, not just for the Jewish people. And in Jesus' audience in Nazareth that day, those people had a sense that they were the ones entitled to God's grace, mercy, forgiveness, vindication, not the rest of the nations. And yet Jesus goes, no, it was for the nations as well. And again, it almost gets Jesus killed. So there's a literary aspect kind of weaving through Luke that finds a bit of culmination here in Luke 7 but both were foreigners. And what's more is Jesus highlights that the dude that comes back was a foreigner, but that we're also told Luke says he is a Samaritan. Oh, the most hated people by the Jews in Jesus' day were the Samaritans. And it's such a, a convoluted history. There's a number of pieces to it. Again, some point I'll tackle the whole Samaritan piece. But just understand, Luke's audience's jaw would have dropped to the ground. Not only because Jesus healed 
a leper or 10 lepers. In fact, Luke has already given us a story of Jesus healing a leper, which would have been shocking, but Luke's audience has already been shocked by the fact that Jesus has healed a leper. What would have been equally shocking or even maybe shock upon shock is the fact that this person is a Samaritan. And so Luke includes that as well. So there's our fourth connection. And then our fifth and final connection I want to highlight in this teaching and where I want to just center the rest of our time is that both returned in gratitude. Naaman goes back to Elisha praising God. This guy goes back to Jesus and it says he falls at his feet and he praises God in a loud voice. Let me just reread that last part. In Luke 17, it says, One of them, when he saw he had been healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. And Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? And then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. For Jesus in this moment, he highlights the fact that nine out of the ten did not return. But the one who did return, in a sense, Jesus praises him. He says, listen, get up, rise, and go. Your faith has made you well. And what's interesting to me about what Jesus sends him away with, these words, rise, your faith has made you well, is that he's already been cleansed. But when he comes back to Jesus, Jesus is almost like saying, okay, your faith has made you well. It's like something else has happened on top of just this physical healing. It's as if the posture with which this guy is demonstrating his gratitude to God, it's as if Jesus says, man, something is going on inside of you that is going to continually make you well. Because friends, I believe that what's going on here is that Jesus is acknowledging that this dude is grounded in gratitude. And Jesus goes, listen, this is the kind of posture with which you want to live life with. We want to be people who are grounded in gratitude. And friends, I know that if you're like me, um, this at times is hard to do. I mean, there's many days where I wake up and the first thing that's on my mind are all the things that aren't going well, rather than giving God praise and thankfulness and offering gratitude for all the things that are actually going well. Now, what I'm saying here is not that we don't disregard the things that aren't going well. It's just that sometimes I think that they become the dominating narrative of our day or of our life. And I believe that what this story is highlighting for us is just this absolute necessity of being grounded in gratitude and being willing to look for the things that we can be grateful for in the midst of our circumstances, especially when they're not going well. Uh, Just yesterday, as I was preparing for this teaching, I I turned on uh, social media or I pulled out my phone and I was looking um, at a couple of posts and there's uh, a particular person that I know who was going through a really hard time and they're connected to this family and everybody has seen uh, recently some things that have come out and they have been just thrown into the spotlight and everybody's aware of something that's happened within their family and it's just been a really, really hard, awful situation. And I was so moved by this person's post because they start off and they say, hey, as as many of you know, the last couple weeks have been absolutely awful. And they said, but, and they just listed several things that they were grateful for. And as I was watching that, I was like, yep, grounded in gratitude. Like they're going to be okay because they recognize that we can't allow all the things that aren't going well to dominate our narrative, that we can always begin from a place of gratitude. And I believe that this is the posture that we need to have, and sometimes we need to be really intentional about that. Other times we just need to be really creative about it. I mean, I remember about six months ago, I woke up and I was kind of having this, you know, oh, poor me kind of day. And I was just highlighting all the things that weren't going well, and I was just really discouraged in the midst of all of that. And I had like no gratitude. And it was almost like I had this moment where the spirit just kind of hit me across the head 
and said, so how can you be grateful today? Now, I generally don't catch this. Like, generally just ruins my mood for the whole day and everybody suffers as a part of it and me as well. And it's just, but this was a moment where I feel like it was a grace gift because I recognized just how negative my attitude was. And it was almost like God was challenging me to go, okay, so how are you gonna be creative today? How are you gonna demonstrate gratitude? Not just say you're grateful, but what does it look like to demonstrate it? And so I was kind of thinking about this and I go, you know what? There are four people that I've never met who have had a huge impact on my life. I'm just gonna shoot them a short video and send it to them. And so I pulled out a camera that was like five or six years old. The audio is terrible, but I just threw it on a tripod and I just spent five minutes for each of these four people and addressed them individually and talked about how their work had influenced and impacted me even though we had never met. And then I jumped onto the companies that they're part of and, and I just sent off, in some cases, the info email, right? Info at so-and-so. And I just said, hey, can you get this to so-and-so? And I was shocked because one of them, in fact, of the four that I sent out, three sent me back responses, one within two hours. And this was a top CEO for a major company in Silicon Valley. And they just wrote me back and said, listen, I've never had anybody do something like this for me. I just wanna extend my gratitude to you for your gratefulness for how I've been able to impact your life. And it was just, I was like, oh my goodness, like we need to live with gratitude, not just because of what we get in return, but just the sense of positive things, just a positive perspective in the midst of what's going on and being reminded that there is so much that we can be grateful for, that we don't want to lose sight of that because when we do have to address those things aren't going well, they're just put into a different light when we can be grounded in gratitude. So friends, where do you need to be grateful today? Like what is dominating your narrative? Uh, Where do you need to be intentional or creative about gratitude so that we can daily just ground ourselves in gratitude, allow things to happen as they may, be put into their proper light, and that we can be one of these people that recognize what we do have and that we get intentional and creative on a daily basis, even if it's just waking up every morning and going, okay, here are the things that I'm just grateful for and allow those to ground us for the day. Because when this guy came back, Jesus goes like one out of 10, like nine out of 10 people were not grateful for what I have done for them. Friends, let's not be that nine out of 10. Uh, Let's be that one. Let's be that one that wakes up every day, grounds ourselves in gratitude, and is just reminded of all the many ways that God has blessed us and is blessing us on a daily basis. So thanks for stopping by. Thanks for hanging out and uh, watching or listening if you're listening to the podcast to this teaching. Uh, Feel free to head over to walkingthetext.com. Leave some comments maybe about how you've been intentional about being grateful or maybe how something that you've learned from somebody else. Uh, We're always looking for really great ideas and feel free to pass this along to anyone you think may just need to hear this teaching today. So again, friends, thanks for stopping by and may you walk out the text well in your life. 